Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Randy, and, and I'm here at River Church, and I want to welcome you to River Church Online. Today, uh, it's really cool. I'm here, but I'm not here by myself. We have a, a, we have a crowd. Can I hear from you guys? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So that's fun. I love preaching to real live people, not just a camera. Uh, although I know on the other end of this camera are real live people, I realize that. Uh, but 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 what I want, what this reminds me of, is is the fact that that something cool is about to happen uh, in just uh, about seven days, I suppose. Uh, we October fourth, we are going to regather for public worship. Uh, I think that's awesome. Now, yay! Yeah. Three things you need to know about that. Three things you need to know about. Uh, number one, um, everyone who comes, you get a River Church mask. You may have seen them. We've got some pictures floating around, but it's it's a mask with our with our River Church logo on it. It's super cool. I've already seen them. I can't wait to get mine. If you if you're here Sunday morning, October fourth, 11 a.m. for our regathering service. Uh, just a week from today, when you're watching this video, then you will receive uh, for free a uh, River Church Mass. So that's cool. Uh, number two, um, on Sunday morning, October 11th, um, on October 4th, rather, uh, we're going to have a pre-service party from 10.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. So, so don't come at 11, come at 10.30 for the 30-minute party. Uh, we're going to have coffee. It's going to be served in a touchless fashion. We'll maintain some space, but just an awesome time to regather, to get to, to catch up, uh, to just, I want to know how you're doing. You Maybe you want to know how I'm doing. So 10.30 to 11 a.m. On that, on that Sunday, October 4th. The, the third thing I want to tell you, and this may be the most exciting part, we are going to celebrate communion together. Now you'd say, how are we going to do that without uh, sharing germs, uh, swapping germs? And this is how we're going to do it. Uh, you're going to bring your own communion elements, your bread, your juice. You bring that with you in a Ziploc bag, uh, in, a, in a thermos. Just like, just like at home for the last several months, you've been coming up with your own communion elements. You bring those elements, and I will lead us, and we will celebrate communion together. So I'm just, I'm just tickled. I'm just excited. October 4th, a week from today, 11 a.m., actually 10.30 a.m., the party starts. Uh, and for those of you that are not yet ready to get out, we're going to continue producing these videos, and you'll be able to participate like this uh, for the foreseeable future. Next thing I want you to know, a lot going on. Next thing I want you to know is that, that this Tuesday night, um, just a few days from now, that's the 29th of September, we are going to have an in-person uh, prayer meeting or prayer gathering. Uh, it's a night of prayer, uh, 7 p.m. this Tuesday night. Right here, I'll be leading. But you'll be praying by yourself or as a family. And it'll just be a low-key, awesome time uh, to pray uh, this Tuesday night, 7 p.m., and in the sermon, you'll hear more about that. So just keep listening, and you'll hear the rest. Okay, well, we're, we're about to, to get started here. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions about River Church, anything you're wondering, you want to know what's going on, you want how you might get connected, go to our, our website, riverchurchrgv.com, uh, riverchurchrgv.com, and all things River Church can be found on that website. All right, well, I encourage you now to maybe get rid of your distractions as worship is about to begin. Fill up your coffee cup if you want. Um, go get something to write with, uh, 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 something, a uh, notepad. Go get your Bible, and then, then come back and settle in, and we'll get started. Uh, River Church Worship Online.
nothing like your love, Lord, your love. Today is Repentance Sunday um, all over our, the country. Uh, in fact, there are some churches outside of the United States that are uh, celebrating uh, Repentance Sunday. Uh, I know that, that many Acts 29 churches within the family of Acts 29, many Acts 29 churches around the country and around the globe are celebrating or realizing Repentance Sunday. So what is Repentance Sunday? It's born out of a conviction held by many pastors like me. A conviction that we as a nation, and that would include us as a church because we don't live in a vacuum, we live in this country. A conviction that we as a nation are experiencing division and destruction. We have relational difficulties um, I would say like we haven't experienced in several generations of American history. And, and so today is really committed, and I'm going to tell you more about it later, but Tuesday night as well here at River Church is committed to, to a heartfelt sort of repentance. Now, repentance can look a lot of different ways in our lives, but what I'm talking about, what we need is a personal sense of repentance, uh, meaning me repenting for my own sins and you for yours. You see, in, in this noise and this dysfunction and this division that we as a country are experiencing, I bear a, a personal sense of guilt for all that noise. I own some of that. You own some of that because we live in this country. A personal sense of repentance, it's the opposite of dull, general sense of a need for repentance. You see, a dull, general sort of need for repentance, we might say our country needs to repent. That sort of dull, general sense of repentance uh, on the part of, of everyone as a whole, it, it doesn't take us very far. A, a dull a general sense of repentance often morphs into a, a, this time of confessing other people's sins. Uh, and it eventually spirals into a list of my enemy's faults, my enemy's failures, the failures of the country as though I don't own, own them. But, but that's not what today is about. Uh, what today is about is personal sense of ownership for my own sin. Today is about an acute awareness of my own personal sin and how that has caused a wedge to be driven between me and others. Me and others 
um, inside this church? My own personal sin that has, has caused a wedge to be driven between me and others outside of the church? So two big questions that I'm going to ask several times this morning. And by the way, we've got people here. I, I said that earlier during the intro, but we've got real live people here, here in, the, in the service. Just just give you, give you the, the truth. It's Friday night and we're taping this. But, but, but those of us in this room, uh, those of you watching this Sunday morning here, here um, on the Internet, two questions that we're going to really wrestle with today. One is this. Am I harboring unforgiveness in my own heart? And the second question would be this. Am I harboring unmet or unrealistic expectations that I've placed on someone else? So, so is there unforgiveness in my heart that I'm just denying or I'm neglecting to deal with? And also, do I have some, some unmet, maybe even unrealistic expectations that I'm putting on another person that's, that's causing unforgiveness to, to, be, to, to well up within my heart? Yeah, we're divided as a country. We know that, and I, I, I'm, I'm heavy-hearted regarding that. But, but what about our church? Churches all over the country are asking the same question. Are we divided as a church? And what about your own home? Are you divided as a family? Who knows, if, if, if we repent this morning, Sunday morning, if, if we repent during our prayer time on Tuesday night, again, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. If we repent, who knows, maybe the Lord will relent. Maybe the Lord will bring healing. Maybe the Lord will, will bring an end to division. Maybe the Lord will, will, will bring an end to destruction. Who knows? Maybe the Lord will he'll bring a vaccination. Maybe the Lord will, will, will begin revival in our land. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe he will begin with us, River Church, and maybe he will pour out revival on our city and, and, and pour out revival on our country. Who knows? But here's what we do know. We do know that historically, when revival comes to a community, it always begins with prayer and repentance. So before I even preach this message, I want you to know that, that Tuesday night, September 29th, 7 p.m., that's this Tuesday night, we're opening up the church for private prayer, for, for small group prayer, for family prayer, and we're going to social distance. We're going to take appropriate safety precautions, but we will be praying, and I will lead you, and I invite you to come and be a part of that by yourself, with your spouse, with your family. Okay, all right, so here's what we're talking about this morning. The, 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 the overarching topic or the, the title is this, how to get along in anxious days. We're living in them, right? Anxious days, how do we get along in anxious days? And there are truths found in the Bible. We're going to look at two passages today. There are truths found throughout the Bible about how I deal with my relationships, sometimes my, my, the toxic or divisive nature of my relationships in these anxious times. So as I said, we're going to look at two main scripture passages, both written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, you know, he wrote much of the New Testament, uh, the, 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 the second half of the Bible. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, the first passage we're looking at, he wrote to a church in Philippi regarding two ladies who just couldn't get along. And then the second passage we're going to look at today is, is a passage that the Apostle Paul wrote to this young missionary named Timothy. And he addressed the wisdom of not engaging in certain type of art, certain types of arguments, certain types of debates that, that merely waste your time and go nowhere and profit nobody. Have you ever had a, have you had a conversation like that lately? It just didn't go anywhere. It, it didn't it wasn't helpful and nobody got anything out of it. So we're going to look at those two passages today. Uh, one one from the book of Philippians and, and one from 1 Timothy. 
First of all, let's look at, at the, first, uh, the Philippians 4 passage. And, and this passage really in its entirety, it deals with a discord, disunity, not getting along with others inside the church. The next passage deals with conflict outside of the church, but this one is conflict inside of the church. Discord, disunity, not getting along. Philippians chapter 4, and I begin with verse 2. Let's read together. It says, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, and this true companion is an unnamed person. I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So he's esteeming these people. He says, you're Christians. Your name is in the book of life. Help these two ladies. Going on with verse 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. The word of the Lord. So what do we know from this passage? What immediately jumps out? We, we know that there is a dispute or a controversy between two prominent women in the church in Philippi. These, these women were apparently pillars of the church. Uh, they had been about the ministry of the gospel and the church had, had been birthed and grown there in Philippi. And, and these two women, they were, they were significant players in the planting of the church. We, we know that they're faithful believers. Paul says that he's confident in their faith in Jesus and yet they still can't get along. Now, the controversy was significant uh, to the point that apparently they couldn't handle it by themselves. It, it was also uh, significant, this controversy, uh, to the degree that it had become a public dispute, at least to some degree, because Paul is somewhere else and he's hearing about it. And apparently those that he's writing to, they're not surprised by the fact that there's this conflict, this this controversy. I, I, I also would, would suppose that it probably wasn't doctrinal. In other words, it wasn't about the Bible. Because if it would have been about Scripture, I think Paul would have just corrected them and then gone on. He would have said, look, this is what the Bible says. Obey the Bible. Let's move on. But he didn't take that approach. So it probably wasn't doctrinal, theological, scriptural in nature. The last thing I would say about what we gather from this passage is that it, it had the potential to do great harm to the church as a whole. That's Paul's concern, that it might damage the church as a whole. Now, now, what this could represent, this relationship, this relational tension between these two ladies, I'm going to say their names one more time. They're hard to say, but they're cool. Euodia and Syntyche. Uh, what that relational conflict could represent for you, for me, it could, be, it could be your conflict with a close friend. Maybe in the church, maybe a conflict that you're feeling right now uh, with, with a close friend who maybe goes to another church, but it's a believer, somebody who follows Christ. Now this could also represent a conflict in your home with, with a child, Maybe a conflict that you have right now with your spouse. Or if you are a child, maybe you're a teenager, this could represent some conflict that you feel with your parent right now. Now, what do we learn from this? Because that's what I'm all about this morning. What, what, like we're all living in, in relational conflict. Every one of us, we have some sort of relational conflict right now. So I'm all about what can we learn from this? How can we make it better? Well, several things. Number one... I would say that agreeing in the Lord is not only a beautiful state, it is a supernatural state. 
Let me say that again. Agreeing in the Lord is not only a beautiful state to live in, it is a supernatural state to live in, meaning it takes the Holy Spirit. We can't get along without the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, 28 it's that passage which, you, which you've heard before, which speaks of how we are no longer in the church. We're, we're no longer Jews or Greeks. Um, we are no longer men and women. We're no longer slaves and free, freed people. No, no, what does all that mean? It, it means that it, it doesn't mean that we give up our identity. I mean, I'm still a man and you're still a man or a woman. But, but what it means is when we come together, there is this unity in Christ, in fact, the passage goes on and it says we are all one in Christ. It means that, that in Christ, we all become one. We're all unified. Yeah, we're still men. We're still women. We still have our own uniquenesses. But Christ supernaturally brings us together. That's what Christ does. That's what the church is about. That, that, that agreeing together isn't just beautiful. It's actually spirit driven. It's what, it's what God does in the church. What else do we learn from this passage? We learn that, that God desires that we agree. He wants that for us. I would say it even, even with, with even more strength. We learn from this passage that we as Christ's followers, we have an obligation to be, the passage says, reasonable. Other passages say agreeable, but, but, but what we've read this morning, the ESV says that we, we should be reasonable. God says you have an obligation to be reasonable in a way, in a way that non-Christians do not have. So later on, we're going to talk about relationships outside the church. And you say, but look, they're not being fair. They're not being reasonable. And I would say, I know, I understand that. I feel your pain. But God's talking to you, to me. And he's saying... Children of God, you have an obligation to be reasonable, to be agreeable. You ever dealt with an unreasonable person? This passage says that God actually desires that others look into your life and they see you, they see me as reasonable. What does that mean? It means not hot-headed, not ill-tempered, not, not unpredictable. That's another good word for unreasonable, unpredictable. Even in an unpredictable, unreasonable environment. I just spent some time today with some people that, that do not follow Jesus. And those people are somewhat unpredictable. They're somewhat unreasonable. And God says, that matters not. Child of God, you have an obligation to be reasonable, to be agreeable. Now, the last thing that I would say we learn from this passage is this. Faithful Christians, we sometimes lose our way relationally. Nothing to be ashamed about. Nothing to beat yourself up over. We just say, look, that, that's just part of being a Christ follower is sometimes I'm, I'm going to lose my way relationally. And then I'm going to pick up God's word and I'm going to find my way back to the center. Back to to the truth. So those two big questions that I mentioned earlier, let me ask them again. Are you harboring unforgiveness in your heart today? Uh, are you like, are you like the, 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 a young man that just last year, I was, I was counseling with this, this young man and, and he, he came clean. He said, you know, you know Pastor Randy, uh, just a few years ago, um, growing up in a, in, a, in a decent home, a good home, a Christian home, I, I, was, I was angry with my parents. I was angry with them, not so much because they'd done me wrong, but, but because they weren't meeting my expectations. I just had expectations as to how they should deal with me as, as their son, this young man said. And, and I, I just, I had, I had really... Unmet expectations, yes, but, but more than that, unforgiveness that I was harboring in my heart. Now, I'm happy to say that he'd worked through that on his own. I didn't even have to help him with that. He worked through it, and he's, he's seen, seen better days now. 
Uh, but maybe you're a teenager and you're experiencing that. Maybe you feel that way toward a spouse. Maybe you feel that way toward a child. Some sense of unmet expectations that has now created unforgiveness in your heart. You know, in reality, in reality, I've seen a lot of broken relationships that should never have been broken in the first place. But here's how it often goes when we have broken relationships. Tell me if you can relate. Uh, we, we think to ourselves, I'm in a bad relationship and it's causing me anxiety. This, bad, this person isn't good for me. Bad relationship, difficult relationship, it's causing me anxiety. And, and dear friends, often... It's quite the opposite. Often the relationship isn't the problem. Often you have anxiety that is causing your bad relationship. Not a bad relationship that is causing you anxiety. If you feel that you're, you're, you're always racked with anxiety, tension, you, you can't sleep well at night, that is going to lead to bad relationships. The problem isn't the relationship. The problem is the anxious heart within. So, wrapping up this first passage today. In a situation where there's tension, in a situation where peace is no longer available, where, where it's just lacking, Paul says, really gives us four, four steps. He says, number one, be reasonable. In a, in a world of, of, of unpredictability, you be reasonable. He says, number two, Christ follower, be joyful. Number three, he says, be gentle. And number four, don't let, it, don't let anxiety take control. Now, we, I preached the whole sermon last week on anxiety, so if you didn't hear it, you can go back and listen to that. But, but the conclusion is, when peace is lacking, God calls his children back to reasonable, agreeable relationships. We're going to put a, a quote up on the, on the screen now by Dr. Tony Evans, and it just, just captivated me this week, so I thought I would share it with you. He says this, and, and before, I, before I read it, I want you to apply this to your own church, your own marriage, your own home, your own family, Dr. Tony Evans says this, God is a God of unity. And where there is disunity and division, his spirit will not dwell. Oh, that we as Christians might fight for unity and reasonableness and agreement in our church and in our home. All right, this next section, we are now going to be talk, talking about discord, conflict with people outside of the church. It could be uh, other Christians, but, but often it's, it's non-Christians, people that don't claim to follow Christ, not getting along with those outside the church. Maybe unbelievers, maybe people at work, uh, maybe, maybe people on Facebook, uh, social media in general. And the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, actually in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and he says this, he says, Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents, with gentleness. Amen. Amen. Okay, so what is Paul saying to, to young Timothy? He's saying this, there are discussions that we should just avoid altogether. I'm finding myself more and more in those kind of situations in these trying days out in the marketplace, out in the world. Uh, there are discussions that we should just avoid altogether. In other, in other words, don't even go there. Don't even go there. You know it will just lead to a debate and a fight. And, and Paul says, don't even bother. It won't go 
well. Now, I can tell you in, in, the, in the, the Caulfield house, and all of, all of us, we're all Christ followers, but in, in the Caulfield house even, there's, this, there's some topics that I know, like, I shouldn't bring it up unless I want to hear a fight, uh, discussion in the Caulfield house home regarding uh, gun control. We just have many and various views on that issue, and I've, I've come to realize, don't even bring it up. It's just not going to go anywhere. It will just be ugly. Now, there are topics of discussion these days that, that only divide and only confuse out in the marketplace at work. And Paul says, don't waste your breath. Don't waste your time. Avoid it altogether. I don't know. It's a few examples might be uh, in some scenarios, maybe just even bringing up COVID-19. It's just not worth it. There's just too much controversy. Maybe masks and the value of wearing masks. Probably not even something you want to bring up in the marketplace these days. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, Russia's meddling in anything ever f for, all of, for all of history, right? Don't even bring that up. Nobody wants to talk about that, not, at least not sanely. And now you can add the, the NFL and the NBA to that topic. Like, you can't even really discuss it anymore. It's just too controversial. And Paul says, Christians, you have an obligation to be agreeable. You have an obligation to get along. I have another passage. It's the same, uh, it's the same uh, book of the Bible, the same chapter of the Bible. Just earlier, a few verses earlier, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 16, he says, Avoid godless, foolish discussions that lead to more and more ungodliness. This kind of talk spreads like cancer. Wow. So what do we learn from Paul's instructions to Timothy? Just a few thoughts here. Uh, the first one would be this, to engage in foolish, controversial discussion is a non-Christian endeavor. That's a pretty heavy statement. The, the act of engaging in foolish, controversial discussion Paul says Christians don't do that. Like Christ followers, we're obligated to avoid that sort of controversy. Now, as a Christ follower, you get to decide, okay, Holy Spirit, what are you, how are you leading me here? Is this a foolish, controversial discussion? Because if it is, I must remove myself. I'm going to have to step out or I'm going to have to take the conversation in a different direction. What do we learn from from Paul's instructions to Timothy. This, the Timothy. The second thing I would say is this. Argumentative behavior, not allowed for the believer. You want to be an argumentative person, I'm sorry, you can't be a Christ follower. Paul says that is not how Christ followers act. That's not how we roll. God obligates us to not be argumentative. Another thought is this. Um, while we can't be argumentative, we certainly, from this passage it's clear, we certainly have the freedom to debate, to correct. But it must be done in love. The passage says this, correcting opponents with gentleness. Am I saying that you always have to roll over and play dead and give up and you can never speak your mind? No, absolutely not. That's not what Paul is saying, but he's saying it must be done in love. Yes, you have the freedom to engage in heartfelt discussions, but it must be done in love. You know, there's a, several sections of the Bible that are, that are committed to um, listing uh, what, a, what a spiritually mature person looks like. And that's most of us, I would say, most of us would say, I want to be spiritually mature. I want to be known as spiritually mature. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, Titus chapter 1, they're requirements for, for being an elder, but, but even more broadly, they're just requirements for being a spiritual leader. And, and they go like this. You, you can't be quarrelsome. Um, you can't be quick tempered. You have to be gentle. You have to be self-controlled. You, you can't be a violent person. 
You can't be ill-tempered and just lash out. You have to be known as a person of peace and gentleness and self-control. It's pretty clear. When we come to church, when we go home, and when we go out into the marketplace, the, the expectations that God has, ha, has of us are always the same, that we will be people who are agreeable, who are reasonable, not argumentative. So, so some final thoughts, some concluding thoughts are this. Um, so it's actually some ways in which I think that we are, as, even as Christians, quarrelsome, argumentative, combative. Tell me, maybe this sounds familiar to you, and sadly, sometimes, sometimes this is how I roll. Um, first thought is this, um, ambiguous criticism of my enemies. I, I want to I criticize my enemies or my opponent, so I'm just a bit ambiguous. I'm not real specific. Uh, I'm not real exact. It's just kind of a fuzzy line that I've drawn, but I, I criticize them. And, and, and what we learn from Scripture is that's of the devil. Why can I say that with confidence? Because several places in the Bible, the devil is referred to as the father of lies. So my friends, when we, in an ambiguous fashion, when we criticize our enemies, our opponents, those whom we don't see eye to eye with, we are engaging in lies, which is the work of the devil. Next concluding thought is this. Um, this, this demonization and dehumanization of my enemy, it must stop. You know what I mean by that? When I say, like, he's not even, he's not even a person. He's less than a person. She's le- how can he think, how can she think that way? Not, that's subhuman. Like, like that's that person, he's the devil, she's the devil. Not only does she dis- do I disagree with them, I'm going to rob them of their dignity and value and worth. It's dehumanization in, my, in the way that I speak. It's dehumanizing. That's born out of pride. It's born out of this sense that I'm, not only am I right, I'm better. Not only am I right, but I'm more valuable than you. Not only am I right, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real human being. You're a less than. This demonization and dehumanization of my enemy must stop. Next thought is this. Chronic argumentative attitudes, they're not only sinful, they're more damaging than we like to admit. Just like Dr. Tony Evans said, when the, the Spirit of God is a spirit of unity, and, and when, where there is disunity, He will not exist. That's why Paul takes it so seriously. He says to the church in Philippi, the two ladies that aren't getting along, do all that you can to, to bring them back together so that the church might thrive. That's why that's why the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, look, those, those controversial discussions and arguments that tear you down and go nowhere, avoid them at all costs. Why? Because it's sin, yes. But even beyond that, they are more damaging than we like to admit. So, God calls us to repent. Now, now what is repent? I was thinking about uh, this this afternoon, the fact that Maybe, maybe some of us don't, aren't even aware of, like, we don't use that word repent. What, what does repent mean? A, a, a good definition, a fairly simple definition is this. It's, it's, it's a three-part sort of a definition. Number one, repentance. Number one, I, I'm sorry for my sin. I, not, not just sorry because I got caught, right? That's not repentance at all. You ever been caught and you're like, dang it, I wish I wouldn't get caught. I'm all embarrassed now and everybody thinks poorly. I mean, that's not repentance. Repentance Number one is real sorrow for my sin. Number two, it's renouncing my sin, saying, I will have that, I, will, I have no part of that anymore. I don't want any part of that sin. And the third, the third part of repentance is this. It's a commitment to obey, to, to obey the teachings of Christ, to say, I will follow Jesus from now on. I, I, I hate my sin I renounce my sin and I, 
I'm going to commit to the teachings of Jesus. Yes, we, we must repent. We must, must repent of how we uh, have, I must repent of how I have sown these seeds of discord in the church. Sown seeds of discord outside the church. Sown seeds of discord in the marketplace, on social media. Maybe there's conflict in your life right now. Maybe there's bad blood that you have with some other person walking this earth. I would say if you're in the middle of a relational conflict, join us on Tuesday night. Join us for prayer. Maybe there's conflict in your home. Now, you would do well this Sunday morning to, to kneel together and to pray and work through that, even, even this morning there in your home. But I also invite you, come and pray as a family on Tuesday night. Maybe you struggle with being an argumentative person, stirring up trouble at work. I invite you, join us Tuesday night for prayer and repentance. Who knows? If we come on Tuesday night and we begin a season of repentance, who knows? Maybe the Lord will, re will relent. Maybe he'll bring revival. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday night, 7 p.m., right here for prayer. I invite you this morning to the table of communion. You know, I, I realize that a heartfelt tension that we feel at times like this is Man, I don't even deserve communion. I, I'm, like, I'm so broken right now. and I, Relationally, there's so much tension in my life. And, and as your pastor, what I would tell you is now is the exact time when you need to run to the table of communion because the table of communion represents the, the forgiveness and the healing that only Christ can bring. You know, on Sunday mornings, uh, and it's, this is going to return soon, on Sunday mornings, we used to be able to, 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 to take that walk, that journey from the chair to the front of the worship space and take communion. And I always think that walk is this, it's, it's this beautiful, beautifully submissive, sort of like a limp to the cross to say, Jesus, I'm broken and I need your healing. I need your forgiveness. So if you're feeling bad about yourself this morning, um, the, the table of communion is exactly where you should go. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he held up the, the bread and he held up the cup. And, and he said, from now on, when you do this, remember me. He, he, he held up the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And his disciples ate of, of the bread. And he said, this represents my body broken for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he held up the cup and he blessed it and gave thanks. And he and his disciples drank from the cup and he said this represents my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of your sins jesus says from now on do this remember me and so jesus that's what we do this morning we remember you uh, you were no you were no victim you were a conqueror you you defeated sin and death and the cross and you brought for us new life and so we celebrate that right there in your own home dear friend maybe you're by yourself and you serve yourself Maybe you're there with your family members or friends. Serve one another. And in so doing, celebrate the goodness of Jesus. Amen.
Okay, well, that, that's it. Uh, it's, been, it's been good to be with you. I, I, I say this every week, but I, I really mean it. it I'm just honored that you invite me into your home every Sunday morning. I, I'm really touched that, that, that you, you allow me to come in and, and speak into your life. Speaking of that, if you're maybe listening for the first time today, you're kind of new to these videos, and you don't have a church home, I would consider it a privilege if I was called your pastor. So if you want to get connected at River Church, um, go to the website and check us out. Send me a personal email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Randy at riverchurchrgv.com. And I'll, I'll tell you how you can get more connected. If you have a need that we, the elders, the pastors at River Church can meet, send me an email and we'll do anything that we can, all that we can, to help you and to, to meet your needs as best we can. Well, now's a good time for you to, to go to the website and to give, to give online. Everything we do here is funded by your good gifts. And so many of you have been faithful, continue to give so sacrificially and beyond over the last six months. Uh, and the way that we do that now is we go to the website. It's, it's quick, it's easy, it's intuitive. Uh, go there. Uh, you can also mail in a check if you'd like. And, and the mail-in address is there on the website. All right, well, so coming up this week, uh, in a couple of days is our, 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 our prayer gathering Tuesday night, 7 p.m. I hope to see you there. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and, then, and then a week from today, our regathering for worship. I'm, I'm tickled. I'm looking forward to that. And in the meantime, stay tuned. Stay on the website, uh, and you'll find out what's going on in real time. We'll be putting it out on the website, and we'll be sending it to you via, via emails as, as, as soon as we know kind of the next step on this, on this journey toward re gathering. All right, well, I think that's it. Love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.